tonight, mourners gather for a vigil to remember a teenage boy shot and killed in North York. To see all the love of the community, his friends, teachers here, it means a lot to us. More than 200 people fill a basketball court to remember 15-year-old Sheldon Samuda, who was fatally shot at Keel and Shepherd on Saturday. Plus, he was on his way to work this morning when the accident occurred. Police officers in York Region are mourning the death of Constable Travis Gillespie, killed in a head-on crash this morning. His death coming during an already very difficult week for police in the GTA. And you are effectively sending these residents away from their families into solitary confinement because that's effectively what's going to happen. Hospital patients in southern Ontario can be moved to a long-term care home up to 70 kilometers away from their preferred location. That's according to the Ford government's plan to ease the strain on health care. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. We begin in North York, where many gathered tonight to honor the life of Sheldon Samuda. The 15-year-old was shot and killed in the area of Keel and Shepherd on Saturday. Talia Ricci was at tonight's vigil that took place at a basketball court where he used to shoot hoops. There is none like you. The stories and memories shared about Sheldon Samuda tonight often mentioned his humor and his love of basketball. If you sad, he can run you a joke, make you laugh. Make you laugh, especially when he was much smaller. Long live Sheldon! Long live Sheldon! And for the 15-year-old's family, this crowd brings comfort. I know my son is loving. I know a lot of people love Sheldon because Sheldon is a loving person. This is actually amazing to see all the love of the community, his friends, teachers here. It means a lot to us and it's also mean a lot to him too. Samuda was fatally shot in the area of Keel Street and Shepherd Avenue West on Saturday. The boy was taken to hospital in life-threatening condition and was later pronounced dead. Police say 18-year-old Elian Brown has been charged with second-degree murder. The devil is a liar. The family planned several candlelit vigils to honor Samuda. Tonight's was open to the community. We're all here today to remember him and cherish the memories that we did have with him. And justice will be served. Samuda had four brothers and three sisters. His oldest sister says she already misses hearing these words on the phone. Sis, are you working today? Can you come and pick me up after work? Because that's our routine that we have. That's our sister and brother time together. Samuda's family says the reality of his death hasn't yet set in. His mother says she still catches herself calling for him at home. His name is Sheldon, but I used to call him. We call him JJ, right? And he loved, you know, his memory was all, will always live on with us. We'll always remember, I will always remember Sheldon. Sheldon will always be my baby Sheldon. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Police officers in York Region are grieving tonight after the death of one of their own this morning. Constable Travis Gillespie was killed in a head-on collision while on his way to work. He was 38 years old. His death coming during an already extremely difficult week for police officers in the GTA. Natalie Collada has more. From above, the depth of the tragedy is hard to see. On the ground, it's clear. It's heartbreaking and um, it just reminds all of us that at any time, um, whether we are in uniform or outside of our uniform, that uh, uh, tragic events can take place in our life. Travis Gillespie was on his way to work around 6 this morning when his white Honda was hit head on by a Porsche Cayenne. The 38-year-old officer was pronounced dead at the scene. The 23-year-old driver of the Porsche was taken to hospital with minor injuries. To ensure members of York Regional Police are not further impacted or traumatized by this incident and to keep the integrity and the transparency of the investigation, Peel Regional Police Major Collision Unit has assisted us with this investigation. Described as well-liked and a hard worker, Gillespie was sworn in as an officer in 2020. 
Salute. He is the second police officer killed this week in the GTA. On Monday, Police Constable Andrew Hong was fatally shot in Mississauga in what police describe as an unprovoked and deadly ambush. This has been a really difficult week in policing. Police Association of Ontario President Mark Baxter says supports are being offered to his members and through the York Region Police Association. One in five first responders in Canada are likely to develop PTSD uh, as a result of trauma that they experience at, at work and 30 percent will have suicidal ideations. And now when you've got these traumatic incidents on top of the trauma that our members are exposed to every day, there are lots of mental health resources available. York Region's chief today describing the unexpected loss as devastating for all members of our organization. Toronto Police Services issuing their support along with the Premier, saying he is gutted by the news of the tragic death of another police officer in our province. And while police investigate, it's unclear as of yet if the 23-year-old driver will face any charges. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. We're expecting more details tomorrow about the investigation into Monday's deadly shooting spree that killed two people, including Toronto Police Constable Andrew Hong. Now, chiefs of police from Peel and Halton will be providing an update at 10 a.m. Today, a book of condolence was set up at the Toronto Police Traffic Services Building for members of the public to sign alongside Constable Hong's motorcycle. Yesterday, Hong's fellow officers brought his motorcycle into the lobby of the building. They brought it through the front doors and uh, they purposely had me distracted while they did it. And I noticed there was a screwdriver missing and a few hinges missing. And the next thing I know, there's a motorcycle in my lobby. So uh, they brought me downstairs and showed me that and I was uh, quite touched. He was a huge part of our team. He was a trainer, he was a leader. Um, he was a big piece of the uh, motor squad. And, that's, uh, and he'll be a tough spot to fill. And that's what we want the community to see. Hong's fellow officers were part of a motorcade today that took the officer's body to the funeral home. Police are expected to release details of his funeral service in the coming days. Meanwhile, a funeral service was held today for 38-year-old Shaquille Ashraf. The father of two was also killed in the shooting spree on Monday. Many gathering at the service in Mississauga today to say their goodbyes. Greg Ross has more. Hundreds gathered at the Islamic Propagation Center in Mississauga to pay their last respects to Shaquille Ashraf and to show their support to his grieving family. It's very devastating for the family for sure. It's two daughters and, and a wife. He was a very loving father, very caring father. The family is still very much in shock. We are in a very tough situation right now. Our family, our kids. They don't want to say anything. There are still many unanswered questions for the family surrounding Ashraf's tragic death and the motive of the suspected shooter. Why would he do such a devastating thing? Family confirmed yesterday that Sean Petrie, who police identified as the shooter, worked at Ashraf's auto repair shop for a short time last year. One of Ashraf's friends told us today that Petrie didn't leave on good terms. He fired him and the person is threatening him, but. Shaquille don't take him seriously. This man says he believes this is what led to Monday's shooting. That has not been confirmed by police. The whole community is affected. We are all saddened by the situation. And the community says they are going to support Ashraf's family in their time of need. Whatever support we can give it to the family, we are providing that. It's not easy for them to absorb this loss and we all uh, stand together with their family. We're also starting to get some new details about the other two victims who were also shot in Ashraf's auto repair shop on Monday. Police have confirmed that one of those victims is still listed in critical condition and is still in hospital. The other victim was released from hospital yesterday and is expected to make a full recovery. As for Ashraf, his body was laid to rest this afternoon at the Meadowvale Cemetery. Greg Ross, CBC News, Mississauga. As Greg mentioned, Sean Petrie is the suspected gunman in the shootings. He was shot and killed by police on Monday following the rampage. A CBC Toronto has obtained court and parole documents, and they reveal Petrie had a long criminal background, including gang ties. Lorena Redekop has more on what we've learned. 
The day the shootings happened, Peel police put out an alert with this photo of a suspect on the loose, considered armed and dangerous, with the name Sean Petrie, age 30. We've confirmed the age is actually 40, with a slightly different spelling of his name. According to information from the courts, Petrie faced a number of serious charges throughout the years, though the most recent we found is from 2016. A number of charges he faced years ago were later withdrawn, including making and possessing child pornography and sexual assault. A parole board decision from 2010 mentions his convictions for property crimes, robbery, drug trafficking and weapon possession. It says his offense history is linked to the negative influence of others, including those involved in the gang subculture. The decision also bans him from being in a large section of northwest Toronto where the preponderance of your criminal activity has taken place. It says you have displayed a comfort with possessing cocaine and other narcotics for the purpose of trafficking, saying that he refused institutional drug screening. Part of his release plan is that he work full time, be searching for a job or be in school. On Monday, the second shooting location, an auto body shop in Milton, is where he briefly worked last year. The owner was shot and killed, two others injured. Petrie was later shot and killed by police in Hamilton. Today, the Special Investigations Unit, which is looking into the suspect's death, confirmed the number of officers involved. In total, four officers fired their guns, two from Halton, two from Hamilton. 17 other officers are considered witnesses. The SIU still has not officially named him. It does confirm his age as 40. It says it has identified him and notified the family, but says that next of kin have not consented to publicly name him. Lorenda Redekamp, CBC News, Toronto. Let's go to Kim McDonald now from the Weather Network with a first look at your forecast. And Kim, a nice day, definitely feeling more like fall. Hi, Keldo. What a day it was. Oh, my. Yes, blue skies, temperatures uh, mild in the 20s. We're looking at a bit of a cool down. We're, right now, we're in between two areas of low pressure, one to our east, one to our west. We've got a ridge of high pressure in place, but it's pulling down some cooler air. So temperatures are going to be a little on the chilly side through the overnight and certainly to start the day on Thursday. In fact, some of the coolest weather that we've seen in a very long time. So here we go away from the lake. Look at these single digits. Orangeville, Guelph, five degrees through the overnight will be more like 10, 11, closer to the lake. And we start the day similarly. So with sunshine and temperatures around that 10 degree mark, a lot of that cold air is falling to our north and east. So if you're headed to the cottage this weekend, you're really going to feel it. But we're going to rebound nicely. And if you're still holding on to summer, I've got some good news coming up. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Kim. New details tonight about the Ford government's plan to ease the strain on the province's hospitals. And we now know just how far hospital patients waiting for a spot in long-term care could be transferred. Mike Crawley has more. There are more than 6,000 patients around Ontario occupying a hospital bed even though medically they don't need to be there. They've been discharged and they're known as alternate level of care patients and most of them are waiting for space in a long-term care home. Now, the Ford government wants to shrink that number as a way of taking pressure off the hospital system, all of those uh, delays and long wait times that we've heard about all summer. So to get those patients out of hospital and into long-term care more quickly, the plan is to send people further away. So new rules say that patients in southern Ontario who no longer need to be in hospital, they could be transferred up to 70 kilometers away from their preferred location for long-term care. And in northern Ontario, that distance could be as much as 150 kilometers. Here's how the Minister of Long-Term Care justifies those distances. This gives us the maximum amount of uh, flexibility so that we can put on the table uh, for uh, uh, patients in hospital who want to transition to, uh, into better quality care, out of long-term care, more options uh, available to them. Now these new rules kick in next week and then come November, anybody who refuses a placement in long-term care could face paying 
$400 a day to stay in hospital. Now, the critics are saying that this plan will be uh, splitting up families, sending people far away from their family support, and it's like sending seniors off to solitary confinement. And the fact that they are trying to sell 70 kilometers is somehow good just shows you how little our minister seems to understand what long-term care is about. And frankly, he should be ashamed of himself. And if we do this, those seniors are going to die uh, a lot sooner than what they would have if they were close to home. It's also unclear exactly how much this will help relieve the pressure on hospitals. The health minister, when I asked her, said that she is targeting it freeing up just 400 beds. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Also at Queen's Park today, MPPs reaffirmed their oaths of allegiance to King Charles III while paying tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. And while I know the Queen had affection for the entire Commonwealth, I believe she kept a very special spot in her heart for Canada. Two minutes of silence were held for Her Majesty this afternoon. Today marks the last day of the session at Queen's Park. The legislature will adjourn until after next month's municipal elections. The Queen is now lying in state at Westminster Hall in London. Mourners will be able to view her coffin and pay their respects until her state funeral on Monday. The Queen made her final departure from Buckingham Palace in a highly choreographed 38-minute procession. A horse-drawn gun carriage held her coffin, and it was followed by her son, King Charles, and other members of the royal family. Thousands of people lined the route. On arrival at Westminster Hall, the Archbishop of Canterbury led a welcome service. As many as 400,000 people are expected to file past the Queen's coffin. Welcome back. Pet owners right across the country are dealing with a shortage of veterinarians. There has been a big increase in the number of people getting pets during the pandemic. And with that, a growing demand for care. And that's contributing to burnout in the industry. Meg Roberts explains. Nicely, Monty. Good boy. <laughs> About a year ago, Sarah Bennett's Great Dane Monty suffered a minor injury while playing at the dog park. The vet told her it was nothing a few stitches wouldn't fix but there was no vet available to do it. Where that's something that I've been fit in in years past. With a rise in pet ownership over the pandemic, demand for veterinarians increased. It has to be actually catastrophic to get into the, the emergency vet. Otherwise, you're waiting for four, five, six hours. And that's, that's sometimes troublesome. Experts say the industry is facing a shortage and other issues. Just like with uh, human medicine, we're seeing, uh, you know, veterinarians as frontline workers uh, and they're experiencing higher than normal rates of burnout. I walked in here this morning, two emergencies on the, uh, in the exam room in the back, both on oxygen. My vets are full on. There's not an empty appointment in the clinic here today. And uh, I know we'll all be trying to squeeze stuff in. It can take up to four weeks for a general appointment at the Dundas West Animal Hospital. With not a whole lot of room for new clients, an issue Dr. Scott Bainbridge believes could be resolved. To me, I think the answer there is to open more vet schools, and if we can increase capacity at our vet schools right now, I think that would make a world of difference. There's only one veterinary school in all of Ontario. It graduates about 120 vets each year. Um, and that's probably not enough to keep up with it. The College of Veterinarians of Ontario says it's focused on licensing internationally educated vets. This past year, about 50% of the 363 licenses it gave out were vets trained in different countries. Bennett says with two Great Danes, she'd like to know that a vet is available when she needs them. You can go. Come on, buddy. Up, 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 up. Good boy. Meg Roberts, CBC News, Toronto. A live look now at the Toronto skyline. Mostly clear skies tonight and through the overnight. Currently, it is 16 degrees in the city. Let's go back now to Kim from the Weather Network for a more detailed look at your forecast. And Kim, the cooler nights are here, but we had a pretty good run, a very nice summer. Kelda, if you thought it was a warm summer, you would be correct. I've got some fun stats here for you. 
We have had 114 days in a row in Toronto where the temperature was above 19 degrees Celsius. So way back on May 24th, that's when it started and we just kept on rolling. That beats the next two times in 2001 and 2016 by a few days. And we could keep going if we make it past tomorrow. So that's, that's the thing. That's why we're watching Thursday in particular. So daytime highs traditionally 21.2 degrees. Our forecast high is 19 on the nose. So if we get a little warmer, we're going to continue our stretch. If we don't, then that's it. 114 days. Not too shabby. Sun is setting at 7.31 p.m., so you may notice that, right? At least it'll be bright and sunny, though, before it sets. And we're looking at daytime highs. There you go, around that 19-degree mark. A lot of people love that temperature this time of year. It is September, after all. But it's not going to last. We're going to be getting right back into the heat and humidity in time for the weekend. But there's the warm front. So this warm front is helping to keep us on the warm side. But on the north side of this and on the east side of this, say you're going up to the cottage or the Corthas or, say, Ottawa, a much different scenario by Friday. This is the departure from normal. So somewhere like Ottawa, 17 degrees, 3 degrees below where you should be. Whereas Hamilton, Toronto, five, three, uh, above normal. So that's the warm front for you. And you can see the real difference. Now, t temperatures are on the cool side through the overnight as well because of those gusty winds. We've had a gusty day, but they are going to ease through the day on Thursday and then by the evening switch around to the south. So we're looking at a weekend where temperatures are back up into the 20s and will feel like the 30s. Thanks, Ken. it to left field. Now that home run marks lucky number 100 for Jays first baseman Vladimir Guerrero Jr. The milestone moment came during the first inning in the game against the Tampa Bay Rays. Jays go on to win 5-1, to one, adding to their lead over the Rays in the tight American League wildcard race. Toronto now has a one and a half game lead over Tampa Bay and a half game over the Seattle Mariners. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'll have your next uh, 11 o'clock newscast tomorrow. See you. Have a great night.